to learn forgiveness as you forgive and we want to we want to be able to give of ourselves as you give of yourself lord we want to be more like you in every way and so we ask this morning as pastor dave comes in and speaks that that each word out of his mouth would be from you lord and that we might leave here changed more like you today than we were yesterday lord each day we want to grow closer to you and so would you change us this morning lord would you make us more like you? Would you make us more holy? We love you so much, Lord. We know that you care so much for us. You are good. Amen. Amen. Well, good morning. Welcome today. It, uh, it's nice to have a, a familiar face back for a week. Our, our friend, we came to know him as Jelly. Uh, Jelly. Welcome home for a week here. Uh, it's good to have him back with us from Indiana now. And uh, he slept in a tent in my backyard on Friday. That was, a, uh, sorry, not a tent, a hammock. <laughs> Way more primitive than a tent. Uh, yeah, thank you for the correction there. A hammock. Uh, and, and evidently slept great. I'm not sure I uh, sleep real great in a hammock in the backyard. Welcome back, and uh, it's nice to, nice to have you with us today. Uh, just quickly before we uh, dive in this morning, uh, we're trying to start rolling out some things here in helping us reading Scripture together, hopefully beginning in October, but we've kind of got some feelers out, we're testing, and I can only tell you what it looks like from an iPhone at the moment. We're, we're doing some things with Android and with our computers, but if you have an iPhone and you happen to have the Bible app, and if you don't, it's free, it doesn't cost you anything. I know a lot of people have that on their phones. Um, if you will open that app, and on the little bottom right, there's a, a little three little lines you can open, um, and click on events. And if you look on events and just type in search KNAS, um, an event will come up, and it will actually even come up this week that will have our text that we'll be reading today um, in there, and you can take notes on that if you would like to. Um, but then Tomorrow, Monday, it will shift to our scripture reading for the following week. And so our hope is that as we continue to lay this out, that we will be reading together in our growth groups, as well as if you're not a part of those, you can still access this. Um, we have a family plan included in there for families with children as well, uh, with some scripture readings from a translation that, that hopefully helps make a little more sense of things. I'll just caution you, Leviticus is just kind of weird anyways, so uh, don't read that going, man, I don't know how to explain that to my kids, but just bear with us through this. Um, but uh, that's the Bible app, and uh, you you can see that it's live and we hope that you'll be reading that through the week so chapter 3 will be leading us into next week we'll continue to have some tutorials some, some things out and links on social media as well as we get there but if you happen to be able to get it would you please give us some feedback um, before we get into this maybe it's some helpful suggestions to say hey I really like this but <laughs> if you could add some of these things we may um, just try some some new things through this journey so uh, let us know how that works we'll roll that out a little more uh, full spectrum here hopefully in the month of October. So Leviticus chapter 2 today that's where we're going to be um, but again we want to just recap briefly here uh, chapter 1 from Leviticus. So last week my hope was we were able to answer the question how do we interact with a holy God? How do we interact as people that have strayed from him through the fall of man that we would read about in Adam and Eve in the book of Genesis? How do we then interact with this holy God? And, and God, throughout human history, has provided ways in which he would interact with his people. 
And in the book of Exodus, we're going to find how he interacted with Moses and, and now how he's going to interact with the uh, people that would become Israel or the Hebrew people of, of that time, how God is going to interact and allow them to interact with him. And so in the midst of all of this, we're, we found that the heart of this interaction is that of sacrifice. The heart of this interaction in the book of Leviticus is going to be the word sacrifice. Now, I want you to think for a moment, where do your minds usually go when you hear the word sacrifice? Like, typically. Just think about that for a moment. Here's, here's where mine goes. You can tell me if you resonate. Usually it's with a, a form of loss or death, right? Like, I, I sacrifice. Uh, we'll say often he was willing to sacrifice his life right like there's a, a cost of life that's involved or blood that would be shed and we found that true in Leviticus 1 last week and if you weren't here we we talked about the animal sacrificial system and and what that would do for God's people and we found in that that God was essentially providing a way to expiate or remove sin through the atoning blood of a pure animal that would cost them something. So they could come and interact through the priest and, and a holy God by offering a sacrifice that did involve a life and blood. All right? That was chapter 1. And in the midst of that, it would cost the person offering it their very best. Now, I have to this week because Caleb was disappointed I didn't go there last week. But I started to talk about our dog, Sam, right? So our dog, Sam, we domesticated dogs here like, like he's our dog. We love Sam. And in the midst of this, for us to have in this system given something that was of value, it would have meant for us on some level going, I'm sorry, Sam. <laughs> We, we got to go to the Lord, and this has got to be over right now. We can't hardly think about that, can we? Now, if you're a farmer, my wife made the, made the point, like, if you're Amish or farmers, like, yeah, you're used to this. I remember going on a milk run with Stan. Stan, only one I've gone on, I have to work up enough nerve to go back because there were cow hooves cut off. You remember that? head on a like we're in an Amish place the head of the cow was chopped off just like sitting there there was I watched one where they were hauling it away and there's just this trail in the snow and I just wanted to throw up right I guess not it's not normal for me I realize it is for some of y'all's but the idea is for the offer in Leviticus 1, it was going to cost you something very dear to you. This wasn't the worst. This wasn't something you had no connection with. This wasn't the weakling. This wasn't the leftover. It was something of great value to you. Reconciliation with God for your sins in the Old Testament and through Christ, we're going to see, costs the very best. That's what we learned in, in chapter 1. And we would find here this offering would remove their sin and, and cover with blood or atonement, which means to make one with God. And, and then we would find in the New Testament that I don't believe it's coincidence that, that Jesus would be called the Lamb of God. That his blood that would be shed would cover the sins of humanity for those who would believe in him. So the question today in chapter 2 then will be, does sacrifice require a loss of life or a blood covering, an atonement? So let's just briefly look at this word sacrifice for a moment. This word in our language came from uh, the Latin. And the Latin word didn't originate from death or loss. Rather, the Latin came from two words, that which is sacred, sacra, right? Something that is sacred, and then it's to make something holy. So we can look at this as sacred and to make is making holy. Sacrifice, then, is the making of something holy, and so a sacrifice then is made when something of value is given over to the holy domain. That's sacrifice. So is it a, a blood offering at times? The answer to that is yes. 
But does it have to be a blood offering to be a sacrifice? And the answer to that is no. Sacrifice. It's something of value that is giving over to the Lord. And so in Leviticus 2, we're going to see some instructions for another burnt offering. And this burnt offering is going to be that of grain. It's with the same purpose as in chapter 1, that that offering would be lifted up in smoke that would be a pleasing aroma to the Lord. So the question may become today then, why grain, right? Why would we go from the animal to grain? Grain to me seems so simple, doesn't it? So common, something that everybody could get their hands on, something that was extremely accessible, something that was general to the population, something basic. But here's what I know, these simple offering of grain was not intended that grain had no value because grain had great value in that culture. And it would still cost the offerer something of value, a sacrifice. In fact, there was a a first fruit offering that was offered as well. And we would find this first fruit was the first fruits that came from a crop were offered to the Lord. Not a portion, not just some of it, but the first fruits. And they did that because they believed that in offering that to the Lord, that he would then take care of them for the remainder of the year, that he would preserve them. This simple sacrifice we're going to read here in Leviticus 2, please do not dismiss it as, oh, it's just grain. Rather, this sacrifice has profound meaning for us today. And I don't believe it coincidental that it follows the blood sacrifice given in chapter 1. So let's read Leviticus 2. It's a longer text today. We'll read most of this together starting in verse 1. There's going to be uh, a formula for uncooked grain offering as well as cooked grain offering. And then it's going to go into first fruits. So verse 1, first the uncooked. When anyone brings a grain offering to the Lord, their offering is to be of the finest flour. Right? The worst flour? No, the value. It's going to cost them something. They are to pour olive oil on it, put incense on it, and take it to Aaron's son's the priests. The priest shall then take a handful of the flour and oil together with the incense and burn this as a memorial portion on the altar, an offering, an aroma pleasing to the Lord. And the rest of the grain offering belongs to Aaron and his sons. This was just quickly known as the priest commission. All right, so it's how the priests survived. Uh, People would bring their offering. They would take a handful or a portion of that, offer it to the Lord, and the remains were known as the priest's commission. In the first chapter of Leviticus, the priest's commission was the height of the animal. So you can see here God is taking care of his priests even as people offer sacrifice. For this is the most holy part of the food, he says, offerings, and it's presented to the Lord. Verse 4 then moves into a cooked grain offering. If you bring a grain offering baked in an oven, it is consist of the finest flour again, either thick loaves made without yeast and with olive oil mixed in or thin loaves made without yeast and brushed with olive oil. It goes on. Oh, if your grain offering is prepared on a griddle, it is to be made of the, what kind of flour? finest flour mixed with oil and without yeast crumble it and pour oil on it it is a grain offering if your grain offering is cooked in a pan it is to be made of the what kind of flour finest flour and some olive oil bring the grain offering made with these things to the lord present it to the priest who shall take it to the altar And then it goes on to talk about the priest shall take that memorial. And then it's going to tell us in chapter 11, um, every grain offering must be made without a certain ingredient, and that is yeast. And we're also going to see that they're not to burn it with not just yeast, but also honey in this text. We're going to explain that here in just a few moments. So let's just move on here together this morning. I believe this text has helped us already, hopefully, answer the question, can there be sacrifice without the loss of life or blood? And our answer is yes. 
So now what we're doing, I believe, is a shift from sacrifice of death to one of life. A sacrifice from death in chapter 1 to a sacrifice of life in chapter 2. It's interesting that even in the preparation of the grain, they are omitting elements. Don't put these things in. They are omitting elements that are often associated with altering the nature of something with an impurity or a process we might know called fermenting. So it didn't want to be defiled. This offering was to present it pure without any form of impurity put in it. Why? Because in that culture as well, death would imply a sense of impurity. It's when we look at when somebody was sick as Jesus was walking this earth, they were told not to touch that person or they would become unclean or defiled. Sickness, death was was a sign of being unclean. Oh, but life in this text, the life of something that wasn't being sacrificed of death or of a blood offering implies that in Scripture of holiness. Holiness. Perhaps we could look to the words of Paul here in Romans 12.1 as to what this might have meant for him. For he says, therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy. Would you read this next portion with me? To offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God, for this is your true and proper worship. Life and holiness exist together. And so as we look at this, perhaps we can be reminded of the words of Jesus in the Gospel of John, chapter 6, verse 35, where he says this about himself. He says, I declare, I am the bread of life. Grain, I am the bread, I am the holiness of life. And whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. So in chapter one, we correlate, we have Jesus, the lamb that was slain for our sins, and now in chapter two, we can find in the New Testament that Jesus is the bread of life that is given so that we might have life. So what's included then in this sacrifice? So we find in this text what is to not be included for specific reasons, but then it's going to go on to say, but I want you to add this to it. I want you to add something that just makes everything better, and that's true for me. So uh, around the dually table, my mom would put a plate in front of me, and the first thing i go get was the salt shaker. And the first thing she would say is, David, I already salted that. You might want to taste it first. But I had learned through the years, no matter how much mom salted it, I was going to add just a a little more. You see, we use salt in our culture today to add flavor to things, don't we? It enhances it just a little bit. We also would use salt in our culture today for preservation, right? Right? And so in this text, God instructs his people to add, help me, salt. Why in the world are we going to add salt to a grain offering? That is the one thing I don't usually add salt to is my bread, right? If you do that, you're just a little off your rocker this morning. Just come talk to me about it. So for them, it would have been flavor and preservation. But when the Lord asked them to include salt, here's what I believe they might have recognized, and that is this. For them, yes, it was flavor and preservation, but it was also something symbolic. Remember, the ancient world is very symbolic, very ritualistic. It's why God is choosing to to meet with them and encounter them in a very ritualistic way they would recognize that this would be a covenant of permanence. Salt represented a covenant of permanence. 
In 2 Chronicles 13, 5, it says, don't you know that the Lord, the God of Israel, has given the kingship of Israel to David and his descendants forever by the covenant of what? Salt. Salt. Did you miss that in your text? I did. Numbers, the next book after Leviticus in chapter 18, verse 19, says it is an everlasting covenant of salt. Help me again, you're falling asleep. An everlasting covenant of salt before the Lord for both you and your offspring. So for them, the adding of salt represented a pleasing covenant between God and his people. When they would add this salt, they would be reminded, I believe, of the covenant that God made with them in the book of Exodus at Sinai. We call them the Ten Commandments, right? They remember that Saul to say, we remember the covenant that the Lord has made with us, his people. And now we find a covenant in Jesus Christ for where we live today is this, that Jesus, the bread of life, would certainly come to offer life to the world for those that would ask of him. Jesus, would would you forgive me and give me life? And then he would ask his followers to do what? To give the same thing. To offer others a covenant that will preserve and flavor. That's the Great Commission, right, folks? Go and make disciples. Go offer salt. Let them see Jesus in you and me so that they might be a part of this and that I might preserve them till the very end of the age. The Gospel of Matthew talks about this, right? Chapter 5, verse 13 and 17, Jesus says, for you are the salt of the earth oh but then he goes on oh but if it loses its saltiness how can it be made salty again for it is no longer good for anything except to be thrown in and out and trampled underfoot and then he says you are the light of the world for a town built on a hill cannot be hidden And neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and and it gives light to everyone in the house. And in the same way, he says, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify who? Your Father in heaven, the one that preserves the covenant. And then Jesus says, do not think that I've come to abolish the law or the prophets. Don't think that I've come to abolish the covenant that God has made with his people. I'm just spreading some salt. Rather, I have come to fulfill them. Here, just for a moment, we have to address the reality that as we use salt and as it reminds us of that, we can lose, if we're not careful, the saltiness. For Israel, right, if we look back, Israel would forget the covenant they made, the salt, the enduring covenant, and they would perish. In fact, they would just wander in the desert for 40 years, right? For followers of Jesus, For us here today, I believe we can do this by forgetting in the same way, but rather we forget who fills the shaker. We forget where the salt comes from. Let me illustrate this. One of my greatest temptations in life is to do and to do some more and to do some more and do some more, right? Anybody else like that in the house? Like, I don't want to just sit here. I want to go do. I don't want to sit in anybody's presence. I just want to go do. And so we can become obsessed with those things and what it looks like and and how we just do more. All about being salt in life. And then there comes this moment in life where I find myself time and time again And if I'm being honest, you know, sometimes seasons happen, and I feel like I'm just coming through one of these seasons. 
where it just feels like you're managing life and you can find yourself no longer useful and in a very dark space. And what ends up happening here is I end up being poured out rather than the salt of the earth being poured out. I am a poor imitation of salt. And so are you. And we can do, and we can do some more, and we can be active, and we can create, we can sing all the songs, we can go all the right services, we can feed the poor, we can do all these things. But if we're not doing it with the indwelling filling of the Holy Spirit that enables us to be the salt of the earth, folks, you will dry up, you will burn out, church will become mundane, ritual, and there will no longer be life in this place. You see, it's a failure to sacrifice the most simple, basic, general gift we've been given, and that is our very life. When we don't come to the Lord and say, Lord, all I have is yours. All I have, all of me, Lord. Everything within me is yours, Lord. I need you. I desire you. I give you an offering of, of life, of all that I am, that you might find it pleasing so that I might be filled with your presence and that I might remember the covenant you have made with me and that I might share that covenant with others. It begins with you and I in a sacrificial relationship that says I'll give you all that I am, as Paul says, vertically up right? Up. And only then, as he continues to fill, can we go out. You know, this morning, as we close today, it's my prayer that we would be willing to offer all that we are in the simplest form, just to say, Jesus, here I am. A living sacrifice. You see, we come to him and die in chapter one, right? We come to him and say, I need you to forgive and remove the penalty of sin through the blood of Jesus Christ. And now, Lord, because of that, I pour myself out as a grain offering, a living sacrifice. Have you experienced this morning the bread of life? He experienced what he has to offer you in the life that he can give. Maybe there's some in this room that have simply forgotten the covenant that you made with him. And today you need to be reminded that it is he that fills us that we might be the salt of the earth. Maybe some of you this morning find yourself tired. Maybe some of you this morning feel like you're just exhausted doing the right things, maybe even. I pray today. Today is a new day where we can say, Lord, forgive me. I just want you. Fill me, Lord. Fill me up, Lord. It may take a season of filling, folks. That's all right. Let him work. Let him work. That we might then be the salt of the earth. I was reminded of a story as Caleb comes about a, a missionary. His name was Albert Schweitzer. Albert was a very intelligent man. He wrote many great theological treatises and, and wonderful ideas on scripture. But one of the greatest things he did was he left it all to go be a medical missionary in Africa. Albert Schweitzer was a gifted organist. He was an educator in the city of Strasbourg in Germany. He had all the financial stability he needed. And yet he shared with his closest friends where he would say, I feel, I know what the Lord is asking of me. And, and I don't like it, but I know it's what I need to do. 
And so I want to give to him the organ. That sounds bizarre. That's like me saying, I want to give to him my guitar, whatever's dear to you. I want to give to him that. I, I'm going to give to him my educational pursuits and all of the acclaim that comes with it. I know he's asking me to, to give up teaching in this university. Oh, and then he says, but, but I believe he's asking me to lose my financial dependency so that I might become more dependent on him to care for me. He left that and went to be a medical missionary in Africa. And here's the wonderful news is he sacrificed those things to the Lord. You know what the Lord did for him? He preserved the things that were dear to him. Albert Schweitzer says, the Lord gave me a piano in Africa. It even had a little pedal. And he let me play music for him. The Lord gave me an opportunity to not just teach in one university, but to teach all over in my community at several universities. The Lord, through my giving of all I had financially, used in his words the organ and the pen to provide for the needs of my life at the end of the day as we sacrifice we can trust that the lord then in his covenant is going to preserve us folks he is able he is faithful this morning to preserve for these last five minutes we just want to be reminded of that in a sacrament in the church, in the church of the Nazarene called the Lord's Supper, where I believe this morning we are reminded of Leviticus chapter one as well as chapter two. We participate in the blood this morning of Jesus, the cup that represent the atonement of Jesus, the removal, the expiation, the covering of sin that we might be one with our Father today, amen? Oh, but we also celebrate his life that was given, the bread of life, so that we too might become living sacrifices. We participate this morning in that to say, I'm dying to myself, but I am living in Jesus. Amen? So if I could have, we've asked a few people just to come and help us serve this morning. If you guys would come at this time. And I'm going to ask that we're going to start in this section in the center. We'll serve the last section last here. But if you guys would just come to the center aisle and then go back to your seats, we'll make sure you all get served this morning. And if you would take these back to your seat, we'll participate together today. I'm going to ask if we could, Travis and Alicia, if you guys would just come and stand right here next to Sandy and Frank. And this morning, if you guys would, starting in the front, just come up. And if you're on the outside, go this way. If you're on the inside, just come this way and return to your seats. And again, just hang on to those elements. We'll take those together. As soon as that's done, we'll move on down here and serve the right side. Please come now.
And as we just finish up serving a few of those, I would invite us all, if we could just stand together this morning. And here's the good news is that Jesus invites all to the table, but we understand that not everybody chooses to dine at that table, and, and that's okay, all right? For those of us that had, let this not just be some ritual we express this morning, just out of, oh, we, we crossed that off our list. But rather, might we allow this to point to our Savior, the one that would die so that we might have life, and the one that lives so that we might live. And so as we take this today, I just ask that, man, if, you, if you're aware, if the Holy Spirit has revealed to you anything that, that has just fallen short of the glory of the Lord, that you would ask for his forgiveness. And that as we take from the cup this morning, the new covenant, that we would experience his covering, his atonement that makes us one for God, one with God today. So as he offered it to his disciples and as he offers to us today, would you take the cup? Might we be reminded of that which he gave for us, his very life, so that we might find freedom in him today? Would you take it? And I did this in reverse, and this always ends badly for me here. So, so you'll just have to walk out of here with chalky mouths today. It'll remind us. He gave his body. He says, this is the bread of life. What kind of sacrifice? A living sacrifice. As you take this today, might we just yield to him, whatever it is, to say, Lord, I know you came as a living sacrifice for me. I want to be a living sacrifice for you. All of me, Lord, fill me, use me, pour me out, Jesus, for the sake of your glory. As we eat today, we're reminded, but we also take action, amen? Jesus Christ, the bread of life given to us, let's take and eat. Now today we just sing as we go. This is our amen, this is our prayer. We sang a song growing up every Sunday called the doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. And we used to do that when we took offerings, right? It's kind of this symbolic thing we're giving our, our offering. Today though, I believe it's of far greater value than that to say, Lord, I'm giving you my life. I praise you from which all blessings flow. And so we sing these words, but I want to encourage all of us today that these not be just words that we sing, but these be words that we live. So we leave here today living sacrifices, living in the praise of God that, that preserves us, that cares for us, that sends us this morning from which all blessings flow. I love you, Lord. I am so grateful for your sacrifice. And Lord, that I get to be called a living sacrifice for the sake of Jesus today. Let's sing together this morning. When we're done, Caleb, if you'll just say amen when we're done, we'll be dismissed, all right? God bless you guys. I love you. Let's lift our voices to the Lord. Praise God from him all creatures here below praise him above ye heavenly host praise father son